Chapter 8 Caribbean Cruise The exultant U-505 returned to Lorient on May 7, 1942, to overhaul her engines, get a new load of torpedoes, oil, and stores, and to let her crew blow off some steam. For the next month, life was fast and easy. Plenty of fresh air and sunshine. No more constant tension and thousands of new faces besides the sixty that had grown so monotonously familiar. Many of these faces were pretty, female, and willing. As the U-505's crew met friends from other boats ashore, their first duty was to brag about the fine bag their own boat had made on its maiden voyage. Sailors' story of their adventures grow in stature each time they are told. But even allowing for this, the friends of the U-505 along the waterfront, were duly impressed, and revised their rating of the U-505 accordingly. After you get through lying about your own exploits in a waterfront cafe, your next duty is to listen respectfully to the tales of your friends. At this stage of the war, U-boats were making a shambles along the U.S. coast, and everybody in Lorient had plenty to brag about. When your friends have listened to your stories, have told theirs, and have finally run out of steam, there will be a somber pause because the next inevitable series of questions begins. I don't see U-252 in her pen. Is she due back soon? Overdue ten days. Too bad. Old Hans Schmidt was a good pal of mine. We went to gymnasium together in Essen. Lived across the street from each other. How about U-577? She's gone. Hasn't been heard from in two months. Well... That's the end of the two hundred marks that Muth owed me. Remember him? The stocky little red-headed radio man that sang all those funny songs? Ja, I remember him. He beat my time with that gal in Hamburg. But I liked the guy just the same. U-587. How about her? Sunk near Iceland six weeks ago by four goddamn British destroyers. But she had time to come up, get off a report and scuttle. They think some of the crew may have been saved by the British, if they got pulled out of the freezing water soon enough. This sort of grave conversation goes on till every new gap in the flotilla has been accounted for. This is a morbid topic, but it was an integral part of life in the second flotilla. Flotilla headquarters never posted any lists of losses, but the word got around among the crews in port just as fast as if Berlin had announced each new loss on the radio news broadcast. Most U-boat sailors took this sort of news with impersonal detachment, feeling sorry about their friend's bad luck, but not worrying too much about what their own luck might be. At this stage of the war, they were only losing about three boats per month, and a good submariner always takes it for granted that he will get back safely from the next cruise. Applying this reasoning to each successive cruise can carry him through a couple of years of bitter war. The repairs needed by the U-505 were minor. She was soon reloaded, and on June 7, she sailed forth again, this time bound for American waters. Reports in flotilla headquarters had told an amazing tale of the slaughter the U-boats were making along the U.S. coast, and Lowe was eager to join the fun and run up his score. The United States' entry into the war brought a major shift in Dunnett's strategy and tactics. There was nothing static or hidebound about the gross admiral. He was a shrewd man who knew his business, and when new situations came up, he reacted to them quickly. He was constantly probing for weak spots where he could make an easy haul. When he found one, he shifted his area of operations and concentrated on it until the sinkings mounted so alarmingly that the Allies had to rush reinforcements there. Then he would shift to another weak spot. When Pearl Harbor plunged the U.S. into the shooting war, we were babes in the woods, so far as anti-submarine warfare was concerned. True, we had been fighting an undeclared war for five months with Dunnets, but on a very limited scale, and far away from our own shores. In general, we were totally unprepared at home in organization training, and equipment to protect shipping close to our own coasts. The lights of our coastal cities still blazed at night, silhouetting coast-wise ships for pot shots by subs. Our ships jabbered promiscuously on radio. There were no convoys in U.S. waters. We didn't have enough planes or destroyers to do a proper escort job. 
and our people simply wouldn't believe that this war that had raged for two years in far-off Europe could reach to our shores. Actually, the only reason why it hadn't gotten there long before was that Hitler hoped to keep the United States out of the shooting war until he finished conquering Europe. Despite our undeclared war, he had forbidden Dunnitz to go beyond the Mid-Atlantic. Pearl Harbor surprised the Germans, almost as it did us. But Dunnitz reacted rapidly. Within a month, he had recalled his wolf packs from the mid-ocean gap, revised his whole strategy, and was redeploying the packs as lone wolves against the U.S. coastal shipping. In January, his battle-seasoned U-boats ripped into our Atlantic seaboard shipping like hungry wolves turned loose among a flock of sheep. Ships were sunk within sight of our boardwalks. On some nights, the flames of burning tankers were even brighter than the city lights. Our beaches from Sandy Hook to Key West turned black from oil scum as the slaughter mounted. After several months of this, we finally dimmed the shore lights, organized coastal convoys, and went to war. Then Dunnitz simply shifted further south and had happy hunting there for many more months than I care to tell about. Just before the U-505 sailed on her second cruise, Dunnitz, keeping a sharp eye on his graphs of tonnage sunk versus U-boats lost, had detected a leveling off in the exchange rate along the U.S. coast as we began to learn our business and had just shifted to a virgin territory where the opposition would be feeble. The previously untouched Caribbean. This was Lowe's assigned area. The U-505 made another easy transit out of Biscay, and as soon as he got out into the mid-ocean gap, Lowe bent on knots and ran surface as much as possible. He didn't want the happy hunting in the Caribbean to be over before he got there. There was a marked difference between the attitude of his crew on this trip and on the one before. The eager beaver, slightly nervous air of the trip down to Freetown was gone, replaced by the quiet confidence of tested veterans who knew that they were good. The plank owners, who had commissioned the boat, now patronized the four new men who came aboard in Lorient to replace men transferred to new boats shaking down in the Baltic. This run across the Baltic was a picnic excursion. The jeep carriers had not yet appeared in the Battle of the Atlantic. You never saw an enemy aircraft out there, except for high-flying, harmless transport planes, heading for the Azores. The U-505 ran surfaced nearly all the way, and Lowe let his crew bask topside in the balmy sunshine all day long. Everybody could have a saltwater bath on deck every day, and as a gesture of contempt, they even set up a mess table and served lunch on deck. They could always depend on sighting a surface vessel first, so with no airplanes to worry about, this was indeed a Garden of Eden, and they had never had it so good. Just three weeks after they sailed from Lorient, and while still several hundred miles from the Caribbean, they found their next victim. One forenoon, the sunbathers were brought to their feet by the port lookout's cry. Masts on horizon, bearing twenty degrees on port bow. All hands below except the bridge watch, barked the officer of the deck. The crew tumbled down the escape hatches to the forward and after torpedo rooms, and the deck was cleared by the time Lowe scrambled up on the bridge and trained his glasses on what the lookout saw. It was a spar no bigger than a broomstick, poking up over the horizon at the limit of visibility. Good work, Muller, said Lowe to the port lookout, then to the watch officer. I'm going to close a few miles on him first before submerging. Lowe headed directly for the spar and noted that it grew in height with gratifying rapidity. With his powerful glasses he saw a crow's nest emerge over the horizon, but there was no lookout in it, so he remained surface. Dunnitz was right that the enemy would be careless in this new territory. After half an hour the top of the pilot house peeked over the horizon. Soon Lowe would be able to see the bridge and, by the same token, those on the bridge would be able to see him. Take her down, he ordered, and dropped down the hatch into the conning tower, followed within six seconds by all four lookouts. The last one slammed and locked the hatch, and in another forty seconds they were submerged, with nothing but the periscope sticking out. The eyepiece of the periscope was now ten feet lower than Lowe's eyes had been on the bridge. The steamer had dropped below the horizon, and only the masts were visible again. 
But Lowe had her course figured out to half a degree by this time. She wasn't even zigzagging. And all he had to do was wait for her to climb over the horizon and steam smack in front of his loaded torpedo tubes. This would be shooting fish in a barrel. That's exactly what it turned out to be. Date, 28642. Type, Am Fractor. Name, Robin Hood Class. Tonnage, 6900 BRT. This time Lowe fired a double shot, and both hit. He remained submerged after his first fish hit, giving the crew about an hour to lower boats and get clear. Then he finished her off with a third shot, surfaced after she sank, and continued on his way to his assigned area. So on the first day, near his new area, Lowe hit the jackpot again. The U-505's lucky star was still rising. On the second day, the jackpot repeated. Date, 29-642. Type, Am Fractor. Name, Thomas McKean. Tonnage, 7400 BRT. This time he surfaced, after crippling the ship with his first double shot, let the crew lower boats, and then finished the job with his four-inch gun. After setting her afire, he photographed the sinking ship in one of the lifeboats and gave the boat medical supplies and directions to the nearest land 360 miles away. As the U-505 wishes the survivors luck and disappears over the horizon in search of new victims, let us now look at another side of the picture in this war against shipping. Statements obtained from all survivors of ships sunk during this period are on file in Washington with the Maritime Administration of the Department of Commerce. I reproduce below a few of these statements from the McKean, without editing. They are given verbatim because they tell the story as only seamen can tell it. A seaman goes back to the very start of the voyage, in telling a tale, and, although many details may seem irrelevant and unimportant, the statements wouldn't ring true without them. To a seaman, such things are very important. Thomas McCarthy, Chief Engineer, made the following statement. I live at No. 20 Hendrix, New Brighton, Staten Island, New York. I have been going to sea for 30 years. I hold a Chief Engineer certificate, which I have held for about 15 years. The Thomas McKean was built at the Bethlehem Fairfield Yard, Baltimore, as a Liberty ship, and I was on her when she was taken out of the yard. As a matter of fact, I was on her for about a week previous to that time, during the trial trips. She was turned over to the Calmore Line for operation, and I formally joined her as chief engineer about May 27, 1942, at Baltimore. I was hired by the Calmore Line in New York and sent to Baltimore. The McKean was in command of Captain Respes when she left Baltimore. She left Baltimore on May 29th, and she proceeded down to Wolf Trap for degaussing. At Wolf Trap, it was discovered that the vessel was too highly magnetized, and the Navy Department then ordered us to Norfolk for deperming. After this work was finished at Norfolk, the McKean proceeded to the Standard Oil Dock at Norfolk for bunkers. The McKean then proceeded from Norfolk Light up to the Chesapeake Bay, through the C&D, Canal to Philadelphia. At Philadelphia, cargo was taken aboard, practically a full cargo with the exception of about a thousand tons. After remaining at Philadelphia for about a week, the vessel then proceeded to Brooklyn to take on further cargo, and from Brooklyn we went over to Edgewater, New Jersey, to finish complete loading. On Saturday morning, June 20th, the vessel then dropped down and went to anchor off the Statue of Liberty, and the next morning, June 21st, we left New York in convoy bound for the Delaware Breakwater. We arrived at the Delaware Breakwater about half past eight or nine o'clock in the evening on June 21st, where we anchored for the night. At 4.20 the next morning, June 22nd, we left in convoy bound for Lynn Haven Roads, where we remained that evening about 11.12 p.m., and where we remained until the following morning. The following morning at 4 o'clock, June 23rd, we left Lenhaven Roads and proceeded to sea on our destination, which was Trinidad, where we were to take on bunkers. We proceeded alone and not in convoy. Everything went well until the morning of June 29, when at 7.20, 
a violent explosion occurred between number five hatch and the steering engine room, starboard side. At that time, I had just gotten into the bathroom and was preparing to take a shave. My room is forward, on the port side, on the boat deck. The first assistant, Mr. William McClintock, was on watch in the engine room. Oil Shepherd and Water Tender Handley were also on watch, both being in the engine room. On this ship, there is no bulkhead between the engine room and the fire room. It is all one compartment. There is no fireman on watch as such, but the water tender is a combination water tender and fireman. In other words, just those three men were in the engine room. The engine room is amidships, and the explosion did not affect the engine room. That is, it did not occur in the engine room. When that torpedo hit, I knew darned well what it was because I had just got torpedoed about six weeks previous, and I had my face all lathered up, and I was just getting the old razor out, and wham! I put on my sneakers and I immediately went down in the engine room, and when I got there the first assistant, the oiler, and the water tender had evacuated. After she hit, they took and got out of there. In other words, when I was going down, they were coming out. So I took and turned around myself, and to take and make sure that I knew they were all out, I made a round of the quarters to check up to see all the men were out of there, because the fire alarm, or the emergency alarm, was ringing continuously. Somebody had thrown that in from the wheelhouse, and everybody was going to their boat stations, or the various stations at which they belonged. So I went back up, and the engine was still running at this time. I did not stop her because I went up to the skipper, and he said, How hard are we hit? And I said, It looks to me like the whole stern is gone. And he said, Take and climb over and see what you can see. And we had these cargo nettings alongside of each lifeboat, so you could crawl down instead of going down the ladder, and fifteen or twenty men could crawl down into the boats at once. So I crawled down a beam of starboard boat number one, and I saw the ship was completely shot. The skipper at the time was on the boat deck and hollered out, What does it look like? I said, It looks like she is finished. And he said, Where are your men? And I said, Nobody is in quarters, and they are evidently by the boats. So I said, All right, I will shut off the engine, because the engine was still going like the devil, but she was not making any progress. So I went down and shut the engine off and came back up. The water tender short, was on the 8 to 12 watch, shut down the service pump, that is the pump that supplies the fuel from the tanks to the burners in the boilers. From the place where the torpedo hit, the torpedo evidently was very low. I would say offhand the torpedo hit her about 15 feet below the surface from the way she acted. She hit very low, and she just took and broke the stern right off. She opened her right up in a perfect V because I could see it very plainly when I was in the netting, talking to the skipper. Because I was standing in there and looking along the shell of the ship, and I could see the whole stern had dropped down. It was perfectly visible from the deck. But what we wanted to look at was how bad it was, and saw she was finished. I went back up and I took and secured the engine there, and shut off the throttle valve, and that is accessible from the main deck in a small compartment there. After I shut her off, I went down in the engine room to see what damage was done there. Then I went back up to the skipper and he said, How is it lined up now, chief? I said, Well, we are a dead pigeon. And so he took and said, I will heave the papers over and you grab a case of cigarettes. And he passed them to me to throw in the lifeboat. As soon as the torpedo struck, Sparks got a message off right away. A wireless message because I asked the captain about it and he said, Yes, the message has gone out that we got hit. And Sparks got a verification on it from various naval bases who picked it up and who were listening in. So after we got the cigarettes and threw them in the boat, the skipper said, Is everybody accounted for? I said, Yes. And he said, Pull away and we can check up on those other boats. I didn't get a chance to get anything. I went in boat number one as all of the other boats had pulled away. After we got off of the ship about fifty feet or a couple of boat lengths away from Sparks came running out on deck, but there was no use to turn around because she was starting to sink back aft 
all of the time. And he crawled back aft, and by that time, the painter on our boat got afoul of the rudder, and we told Sparks to jump, and the skipper cut the painter loose, and Sparks jumped then, but he didn't want to jump, and we pulled him in the boat, and we squared the boat away, and hauled back aft in case anybody was back aft, and if they wore, they should have been in the water, but there was nobody there. After we got about six or eight boat lengths off the starboard quarter, we came right around and the stern of the boat was completely off. And we pulled around the starboard quarter and we went by where she was blown off and we took and laid there. Just as we started to slack off, the submarine broke surface right abeam of us, but she come about a mile off. It was the first time I had seen her. She started shelling the ship and the first four shells were short because she was too far off and the range was too great. She had a four-inch gun and a three-inch gun, and they kept moving in and firing all the time until they got right up on her, and they started to work. They started, and they took and raked number one hatch. That was where we had the dynamite and that fifty caliber anti-aircraft ammunition. And then, after they shelled that for a while, they moved to number three. They didn't touch number two but they moved to number three. That is where we had the highly inflammable gasoline and various accessories for planes and tanks. And after they got going good in there and got a fire started in there, they moved back to number four hatch. They stayed in that position, but they shifted the guns. Then they blew up the deep tank, the fuel oil tank. They knew where everything was. I think only one shell hit the engine room. It took about an hour, between an hour and a quarter, and an hour for the vessel to sink. I saw her go down completely. We were about a quarter of a mile off, and number three boat was alongside of the submarine. She had an injured man in her. One of the gunners had an injured hand, and they gave him a package of medicine. After she shelled the ship, after she shelled her for about half an hour, then she went by the stern and cruised around, and came back up again. And then she left that three-inch gun, the aft gun, have a little target practice. The three-inch gun fired about twelve or fifteen rounds, and the ship was settling all the time. And then the submarine went back and stayed in its original position until the ship sank. After they had shelled her there and had her afire, the ship was laying down by the stern. Then the submarine came from this position amidships, where she had been shelling her, and moved around the stern right by our lifeboat, and then she cruised over here, indicating, and came back by here again. And then they let the after gun, the three-inch gun, have a little fun with her, and fired twelve or fifteen rounds at her. And then the submarine went over and stayed in its original position until the vessel sank. And after the vessel sank, it went back to where the second mate's number three boat was. Of course, the boat was plainly marked Thomas McKean, Baltimore, but the submarine wanted to know where it was from, and I believe they told him. The submarine gave number three boat some kind of sleeping potion for the man that was hurt, and some first aid equipment. We saw him for over two hours because he talked with the second mate in number three boat, and then he proceeded southeast, and he was still afloat still on top of the water when he went over the horizon. There were three naval men on watch in the pillbox on the starboard quarter, and after the explosion we did not see any of those three men. There was another man, one of the crew, whose name was Russell Funk, a wiper, who was sleeping on number five hatch. He was injured very severely, and he died, and we buried him at sea. A sailor from number three boat picked him up from off the deck and put him in the lifeboat. I cannot tell you the name of that sailor, but he was a Canadian. He is a naturalized American citizen now. I cannot say definitely whether this man Funk was dead when he was put in the lifeboat. There was also a gunner stationed in the pillbox on the port side aft, and he was blown completely overboard, but he swam back to the ship to help out. He later got into number two boat, the first mate's boat, he was cut around the head very badly, and also on his left leg, and he had lacerations and abrasions all over his body. He was taken care of in the boat, and he was left in Norfolk, 
at the naval base. There were a few others who received small cuts and abrasions, and there was one other gunner who had his left hand severely injured, and it was that man to whom the man on the submarine gave some aid. That man was in number four boat. I understand all of the other men have been accounted for. The ship was equipped with guns forward, amidships on both sides, and on the stern. The guns were all manned by a Navy crew. There were fourteen gunners and a lieutenant junior grade on board. I cannot give you any definite information as to how these guns were manned at the time of the submarine attack. After the sub had left, and the ship at that time had completely gone out of sight, she was sunk. We took and pulled over near the second mate's boat to check up on how many men he had on, and how many were injured. So he said, I think I got a dead man here, Captain. And everybody was a little upset about it. So the skipper said to me, Chief, you'd better look at him. So I asked them what test they had made to find out whether he was dead. And after they had told me what they had done, I said, All right, did you burn his feet with a cigarette butt? They said, No. I said, All right, let's try that. We tried that. I put my finger on his pulse to try to get any reaction, but got none. And I watched his eyes, and then we burned his fingertips, and there was absolutely no sign of anything in his eyes or anywhere else. And you could see that rigor mortis had already started to set in. So he took the hooks out of the lifeboat that he was in, and took the hook out of our lifeboat, which was number one, and we took the afterhook out of number three boat, and made a couple of lanyards out of number seven thread line that we had in the boat and secured the hooks to his ankles and dropped him overboard. We took an account of the men again, and the captain said, All right now, we are here on the chart. All of the boats were equipped with charts. Each boat had a sextant and necessary equipment with regards to water and food and medical equipment. Each of them had everything, and the captain said, All right, and he told the three mates, Here we are. We are about 66 east and 20 north. So we said, all right, we will have to make it southerly as much as we can to land in the islands. Because it was a westerly set there, which was swinging us to the westward, and there was an easterly wind there all the time. I think they call it trades. We started, we got underway, we got the sails rigged in each of the boats, and we started off. Number three boat was equipped with a motor with a tank of gas and all ready to go. It was not equipped with a regular trysail. It just had a square sail, and then it started to drag behind after the three of us got started. That was number one, two, and four. Number three had the motor. So after they started dropping back, the captain said, We better get back and see what is the matter with them. So we dropped back and asked them what seemed to be the trouble, and they said they could not get the motor started. The motor had been tested out the day previously and found to be in working order. So I transferred from the skipper's boat number one to number three boat and wanted to know what the trouble was. Well, they wanted to know where the battery was and different things. So I turned on the ignition and got gas in the carburetor and spun the engine and it went off. Then the captain gave the second mate, who was in command of number three boat, Mr. Foster, instructions each nightfall. No matter which boat fell behind, he was to use his engine and consolidate all the boats at sunset. The first evening at sunset around 7.30, the third mate's boat, which was number four, and the second mate's boat, which was number three, had dropped behind. The second mate took the third mate's boat in tow, and all of the boats were consolidated. That first evening around ten o'clock, the captain wanted to know how they were making out in regard to smokes, and some of the boats were short of cigarettes, and we had the case the captain gave me to throw in the boat. So we divided up the cigarettes. The same orders were in effect to continue to make as much south as possible on account of the westerly set. And then any boat that was lacking, the motorboat was to pick her up. Forty-eight hours after the sinking of the vessel, all the boats were in sight. Number three boat, number four boat were plainly visible by both number one and two, right after sunrise, which is approximately around 4.30. At noontime, boat number one, the second day out, and boat number two were running within a mile or so of each other. 
Boats number three and four were over the horizon. You could not see them. Well, we held a consultation at the time to go back for those two boats. That is, the captain did, to see if they were in difficulty or not. But it was decided to keep sailing, until nightfall, that is. Numbers one and two boats did. They decided to keep sailing until nightfall, that is, before sunset to see whether the motorboat would come along with the other boat in tow. That night, a heavy squall came up, a heavy northeast wind and rain, and the skipper thought to go back to look for the other boats would be foolhardy and would jeopardize the men we had in our boats. We had twenty-nine men in those two boats. Well, we lost the mate's... Well... We lost the mate's boat that night, sometime around midnight. The mate's boat was number two, and the following morning, with the heavy northeast sea running, we were out of contact with the mate's boat. We are still hauling to the south, as much as possible, and steering a course of south by west, making it southerly, as much as possible, on account of the westerly set. So approximately twenty-four hours afterwards, around eight or nine o'clock in the morning, the lookout on our boat, number one, spotted a sail aft. So when we came up on the crest of a wave, everybody looked and we could make out the mate's boat by the way he had rigged her. That was number two boat. All that day, he was within sight of us. That night, we lost him again. And the following morning at approximately nine o'clock, nine or ten o'clock, a United States plane sighted us and took and dropped down a message for us to hold our course we were steering south by west, and they would contact the shore and send out aid. We sailed that day until five o'clock approximately. A big bomber came out. It was an amphibian and looked us over. And about half an hour afterward a cutter appeared over the horizon, and it came alongside and picked us up sometime between five and six in the evening. That was on Friday afternoon or Friday evening. I do not know the day of the month. We were four days out that morning. It was July 3rd when we were picked up. It was a minesweeper, number 58, which picked us up and landed us at St. Thomas around 3 o'clock in the morning of July 3rd. When we got aboard the cutter, everybody was checked off in regard to their name and next of kin and given whatever comforts that they could. We were brought from the cutter and they got some soup and a light meal for us at the gas station or rather the submarine barracks. It was a submarine base where we landed at, and we were given a place to sleep. Night before last at Norfolk, the agent of the Kelmore line there, Mr. Smith, told me that one boat had landed at San Kitts, which was evidently the second mate's boat, because I could check it by the number of men in it, and the other boat landed in San Domingo. That was the third mate's boat. That would be number four boat. When we landed on the cutter, the crew of number two boat, in charge of the mate, were already on board the cutter. They had been picked up two or three hours previous. We were transferred from the submarine base at St. Thomas to San Juan by the Coast Guard cutter Unagla, and landed on the dock there, and put aboard the Navy transport, which brought us to Knob, Norfolk. That is, the Norfolk operating base. They fed us there in the afternoon. That evening, around nine o'clock, we were transferred by the agent from the operating base to a hotel den in Norfolk. We got the hotel ourselves. He gave us money for transportation up to there. I received no injuries. I lost everything I had on board. I had a brand new outfit, and I didn't get anything off the ship except what I had on my back. I had no shoes on, even. I, as well as everyone in my department, made out a list of the lost personal effects and these lists were turned over to the captain. The total number of men we had on board were fifty-nine. Four of them were passengers, technicians. I think they were airplane technicians. I do not know their names, but they were being sent to the Near East. There were fifteen gunners, including Lieutenant Slack. All of the rest of the men on board were members of the crew. The McKean was an oil burner, her horsepower being twenty-five hundred, with two B&W boilers rated at 4,200 horsepower. All appliances were in excellent shape for a new ship. That applies to the time of the torpedo attack. And I think this ship was a tribute to the people who built her. The ship between perpendiculars was 400 feet long, with a beam of about 60 feet. 
Her tonnage was 8,010. That is, her carrying capacity was 8,010 tons. She was a Liberty-type vessel. We did not push this ship at any time. And at the time of the submarine attack, I should say we're running about ten and a half knots. I did not save any of the engine room logbooks, as I had not time. I was concerned with getting the men off more than with saving logbooks, and I did not save any of them, although I understand that the captain saved his. End of Chief Engineer's Statement The above is a typical sailor telling his story exactly the way a sailor tells it. The story begins when he reports aboard the ship, and he accounts for every port she visited, and every time she anchored or got underway again. No fiction writer could duplicate his description of the torpedoing. Very few would think of having a chief engineer go back down, below, for a last look around while the ship is sinking and being abandoned, just to see what damage had been done to his ballywick, and very few real engineers would be able to resist the urge to do exactly that. A good novelist could easily make a chapter out of the chief's terse statement about the radio man who went back. But he didn't want to jump. His description of the manner in which the sub shelled the ship, and his conclusion that the Germans do exactly what was in each hold, is typical of what many sailors thought at this time. However, Lowe's encounter with the McKean was by pure chance, and he certainly knew nothing about how she was loaded. I don't know why it's important to tell how they rigged the dead man for burial, using number seven thread line, but no seaman would admit this detail from his tail. I'm sure that when the chief was starting that engine for number three boat, he must have made comments which would be worth handing on to posterity, about the intelligence of the fifteen swabs who couldn't even find the battery. You can almost see him spit when he says, So I turned on the ignition and got gas in the carburetor, and spun the engine, and it went off. I'm surprised he didn't add, what the hell else could it do? And why couldn't one of those fifteen helpless lugs have done the same thing? Naturally, he takes occasion to say that this piece of equipment in the engineer's department had been tested the day before and found to be in working order. He winds his statement up as any chief engineer would by explaining why he couldn't save his papers inferring somewhat testily that he was busy with more important matters while the captain was loading archives into the boat. Roland L. Foster, Jr., second officer, made the following statement. I live at 831 Fairfax Avenue, Norfolk, Virginia. I have been going to sea since 1936. I hold a second officer's license, which I have held since February 1942. The Thomas McKean was the first Calmore Line boat I ever worked on. I joined her as a second officer at Baltimore on May 26, 1942. I went on her in the shipyard and was on her during the trial trip. I was on her when she went down to Wolf Trap for degassing, and from there to Norfolk for deperming. From Norfolk, we proceeded up to the Chesapeake Bay through the c d Canal to Philadelphia where we started to load cargo. From Philadelphia, we went to New York, where we finished loading the cargo. On the morning of June 21, we left New York in convoy. That night, we anchored in the Delaware breakwater and left early in the morning of the 22nd, still in convoy for Norfolk, where we arrived 10 p.m., June 22nd, and we anchored. The convoy was dispersed at Norfolk, and on the early morning of June 23rd, we left Norfolk bound for Trinidad. Everything went well until the morning of June 29th, when we were attacked by a submarine. I think our position at that time of the attack was approximately 22.10 north latitude and 60 west longitude. My watch was from 12 to 4. By my watch, the attack took place at 7.29. I was asleep in my room, and the explosion woke me up. I jumped up right away and looked at my watch, and it showed 7.29. Well, the first thing I did was my license was laying on the corner of the deck, and I grabbed it in my life preserver and rushed out on deck to my lifeboat station, number two, that is on the starboard side aft, and I released the strap around it that holds it on the side of the ship. By that time, the AB and the boatswain were up to take the falls, and I went on the bridge to my sextant and chart, and then I came back, and they had the boat waterborne, 
when I got back. When I went on the bridge, I told them to lower away, and I went to get my sextant and chart. And when I came back, I got in the lifeboat, and we took a wounded man in the boat at that time, and we shoved off from the side of the vessel at 7.36. Everything was orderly, and there was no confusion, and everybody went to his boat station. Each officer and the captain got away in his respective boat, and it was pretty generally true that there was no confusion, although I did have one man more in my boat than was supposed to be in that boat, but I transferred two men later to number one boat, the mate's boat. I started out with fifteen, including the engineer wiper. The wiper was buried at sea, and two men were transferred to the mate's boat, which left number three boat with twelve men in it, four of whom were passengers. The man who was buried at sea was a wiper by the name of Russell Funk. One of the passengers told me that he was sleeping back aft where the explosion occurred, and that the wiper was sleeping back aft also, and that the wiper had been injured by the explosion. He was brought up to my boat by some of the other Navy crew that was back there, and they just dropped him on the deck and went on their boat. He was dropped on the deck by my boat, and they went to their boat. The wiper was still alive when he was placed in my boat, and I gave him medical attention and was still working on him when he actually died. He died within about an hour after the explosion, or an hour and a half, and not very long after he was placed in my boat. He died right after the submarine went from alongside my boat, which I will describe hereafter. This wiper was hurt internally, but I did not know it when I was working on him. He had wounds to the face and neck, and legs that I was treating. I forget what I washed them with, but it was an antiseptic, and I put on clean bandages, which was all I could do. He never really talked any, but he did some mumbling. He was in considerable pain. There was some fellow hurt in the third mate's boat, a gunner. I saw him in Miami the night before last, and his hand was healing all right. I do not know anything about the other gunner, who I have heard was cut across the forehead. I never even heard about that casualty until I heard one of the boys speak of it here, a little while ago. We had conducted boat drills on this vessel, and there was no reason why everything should not have gone along in an orderly fashion, as it did go. When I first saw the submarine, it was 7.45. That was the first time I saw him. Whether he had been on the surface before that or not, I could not say. The second engineer said he saw him before we left the deck of the vessel, but I did not see him. When he surfaced, we were between him and the ship. We were in his line of gunfire, He waited for us to row our lifeboat out of the way before he started firing, and the first shell hit very close to our lifeboat and fell in the water, and that was the only shell that missed in the entire firing. The fellows in our lifeboat counted 39 other shells, which were fired in three periods. After the second period of firing, he came alongside my lifeboat, and he came up, and the commander of the submarine hollered through the megaphone, Please come alongside, in English. That is all the commander said. And then his interpreter, I cannot say what he was, he only had on shorts and had a big red bushy beard and no other identification. No identification as an officer at all. I do not know what he was. All I know is he was the interpreter, and he asked us whether we were an American ship, and I said yes. He wanted to know what kind of American ship, and I said an American merchantman. He said, Gut, in German, and he wanted to know if there was anything he could do for us. He gave us first aid bandages for the wounded man. He wanted to know where we were bound, and before I had a chance to say anything, some member of the lifeboat crew or a passenger, one or the other, said, Trinidad, and that is all that was said about that. Then he said, You are carrying munitions, yes? And then he looked at every one of us in the lifeboat, with that wicked eye he had, as much as to say that none of you had better say no to that, and I would say approximately thirty of those shells were fired at the hold where the munitions were in, and that looked to me suspicious, but maybe it was not. And I asked him, what was the course to the nearest land? And he understood me to say I wanted him to tell me to the nearest land. I said, no. He said, no, we cannot do that. We haven't got the time. I said, I didn't say that. I said, the nearest course to land. He said, steer mit the wind. He turned around to the commander and he said, 
He says he is going ashore. He says he is going ashore. He shouted it for the second time. I am sure there were Germans, mostly young. They had a very large submarine. I read in the paper this morning where about some other fellows said it was 250 feet, and I would say it was about 200. She was very maneuverable, and I would say it would do 22 knots. She had a swastika and a German ensign, and she also had a lioness painted on the side of the conning tower. This lioness was standing on its hind foot, I believe its left one, and in its front paw it had a big hammer, and in its tail it had a torch. They were all the markings on there. Her paint looked very good. Some of the fellows were very suntanned, and the majority looked like they had been faring pretty good in those islands down there. It was very nice weather that morning. The rest of the trip it went on well because we'd gotten all right. But we had very rough weather, and we landed at the northernmost tip of Anguilla, British West Indies, on July 5 at 11.10. We were not picked up. Our provisions were all right, but the water was not good. Our keg of water was sour. It was a new ship, and water had not been changed in the keg. And I heard the trial master of the ship tell the mate to change the water four or five times, because the water was going to be bad if he didn't. We drank it, but I thought it would make us all sick. On July 2nd, we were spotted by a PBY naval patrol plane at 9.05, and he dropped us some food rations and pemmican and malted milk rations, and he circled us for quite a long time, and he went out of sight to the southwest, and we never saw any more of him, and never heard any more from any other naval vessels. The mate's boat seemed to sail faster than the skipper's, or the third mate's either. And this motorboat, she just was not equipped for sails. She had no place to step a mast, but we did rig it with a rope yarn. And what rope we had in the boat. I cut a place in one of the thwarts, one of the seats in the lifeboat for the mast to sit in. We only had one mainsail, and we made a jib out of the distress flag. During the first day, they sailed right away from me. We tried putting the boats together, and it would not work, and the captain said that at night to tie the boats up together, and we would all be together every night, and I did that once during the day, towed them all up together, and at nightfall I rounded them up again, and each time they sailed away from me. No one said nothing to me about coupling my boat to their boat because they knew I couldn't sail. Well, the next morning I did not see the skipper's or the first mate's boat, but I did see the third mate's boat. I started up the motor and ran up to the third mate, and he got a line ready for me to tow him on, and when I got even with him, I could just see the mate and the captain sailing together. He got his line ready to tow, and I told him I was not going to tow any more. I was going to sail, because if I did this twice more, all of the gas would be gone, and if a squall would come up and blow my sails away, where would I be? I did not run the motor any more, until July 4th. I did not have any navigation books. I had a sextant. I was only able to get a latitude each day at noon, and on July 4th I figured I was 60 miles north of the British West Indies, and I started the motor, and I ran it from then until dark that night and the next morning. I sighted land, and we started the motor again and ran on in. All told, I ran the motor about 15 hours, I guess. I landed at Anguilla, which is the northernmost island in the British West Indies. From there they sent us in a schooner to St. Kitts. There the British authorities took charge of us. We went to the government hospital there for about three or four days. I won't say for certain. And then they got in touch with the American consul at Antigua. We were sent again by schooner to Antigua, which took about 54 hours altogether to get down there. At Antigua we were put up in a hotel there, until we could get in touch with the company that they made arrangements to get us back by Pan American. We were flown to Miami and came up from there by plane. Nobody in my boat was injured by this experience. Some of them got sunburned, but they got over it all right. I did not sustain any injuries. I made out a list of my personal effects before the vessel sailed, and I gave it to the captain. I saved my sextant, which I had on my list, but that is all I saved. As to the lifeboat, I turned it over to the British authorities at Anguilla. End of second officer's statement. 
Notice in the above statement the things that a sailor man grabs first when he gets jarred out of his bunk by a torpedo explosion. His license, and then a life preserver. This ship may be on the way to the bottom, but to get a job on the next one, he's got to have that license. Note also that by this time the U-505 has a lion rampant painted on the conning tower. There is one feature of this statement particularly worthy of notice and comment. Foster was second mate of the McKean, but after his ship got sunk was skipper of number three, lifeboat. And speaking of what happened on the McKean, he always says, We left New York. We were attacked. In telling the tale of the lifeboat, he says, I started out with 15. I was 60 miles north. I landed at Anguilla. This is characteristic of seafaring men. And speaking of events on a voyage, everyone in the ship except the skipper says, We did so and so. The skipper says, I did so and so. Or if telling what another ship did, will say, He instead of she, meaning the skipper of the other ship. Usually around the bar of an officer's club, with everyone in civilian clothes, you can sort out the skippers just by listening for the pronouns they use. This is not because of any egotism on the skipper's part. It's simply a custom of sea, stemming from one of the elementary facts of life at sea. There is no other job in the world where one man has unquestioned authority and responsibility so firmly fixed on his shoulders alone. He can get plenty of advice, but in theory at least, he must reject all the bad advice. The skipper makes the final decisions, holds the sack, and sweats out many a night watch wondering whether he is right or wrong. If he loses his ship, he will have to say I when he testifies at the court-martial, even though disaster was the fault of subordinates. So why shouldn't he say I when astounding his listeners around a bottle? In Foster's case, he automatically shifts from we to I as soon as the ship goes down and he becomes a captain, even though his command is only a lifeboat. Foster had one important command decision to make when the third mate's boat demanded a tow from him. The skipper had given him instructions about towing the day before, but meantime it sailed off and left him. Foster was senior to the third mate, so in naval parlance he was now the senior officer present, and as such exercised his prerogative to decide he would not tow number three boat. Foster did a good job with his command. The nearest land to the scene of the sinking was Angola. He sailed directly to it in seven days. Number four boat wandered off to the west and took nine days to reach San Domingo. Note also that Foster is a man that Diogenes would be proud of. At the end of his statement, he tells his owners that although he expects to be reimbursed for most of his personal stuff, he did save his sextant. Contrast to the salty informality of the above two reports with the following official report from the U.S. Consul at Ciudad Trujillo to the State Department. Ciudad Trujillo, D.R., July 17, 1942. Number 0026. Subject. Destruction by enemy action of the S.S. Thomas McKean of the Kelmore Line. The Honorable Secretary of State, Washington, D.C. Sir, an application of my cable, number 327 of July 10, 1942, concerning the destruction by enemy action of the steamship Thomas McKean of the Kelmore Line. I have the honor to submit certain additional information concerning the incident. The Thomas McKean was a 10,000-ton freighter on her maiden voyage carrying a valuable cargo of food, general supplies, aviation gasoline, and 11 airplanes bound for Trinidad, Cape Town, in further undisclosed locations. The attack on the vessel took place at 7.25 a.m., June 29 last. At that time, the vessel was approximately 500 miles off the coast of Trinidad, about 60 degrees west and 23 degrees north. The submarine fired a torpedo without warning, which hit aft, putting the stern gun out of action and killing instantly three naval gunners, Bragg, Anthony, and Allen. The ship was abandoned within ten minutes after the torpedo attack, but in this short space of time, a wireless call for help was sent. Four lifeboats were launched. The last men to leave the vessel were naval gunners Coxwain, Albert H. Rust, Roy Adams, Dorsey Lee Grave, and Jack Hannon. The latter was suffering from split fingers on his left hand and from shock. 
Although the ship was flooding rapidly, the gunners took time to carry an unconscious merchant seaman to safety with them. The conduct of these four men, who range in age from 17 to 19, is highly deserving of commendation, not only for their calmness in action, but for the example which they gave to the merchant seamen. The condition of the vessel after the first torpedo explosion made it impossible for any of the defensive armament to be brought into use. The submarine, which was painted white, surfaced shortly after the men had abandoned ship, and from a position 4,000 yards off the stern of the Thomas McKean, proceeded to sink the vessel by gunfire. And all 57 shells were fired by the submarine, and the Thomas McKean sank in approximately one hour and 20 minutes. Following the sinking of the Thomas McKean, the submarine approached the lifeboats, and an officer asked the men in English whether they needed medical aid, food, or direction. The survivors replied in the negative. The men in the lifeboats gained the impression that the submarine commander knew the destination of the Thomas McKean, since he asked no questions in that regard. The lifeboat, which brought the 14 survivors of the Thomas McKean to the Dominican Republic, was in charge of 3rd Officer William S. Mucci, apparently a very able and well-qualified officer. The men were in the lifeboats nine days before reaching the Dominican coast. And, for the reason that the compass of the lifeboat was broken, Mucci was obliged to navigate by the stars. Although the lifeboat was new, when the men attempted to use the oars, the oar locks broke. When they attempted to mend the oar locks with the tools that were in the lifeboat, the tools broke. Had it not been for the fact that the lifeboat was equipped with a sail, their ordeal would have been much more difficult. A few hours after the sinking of the Thomas McKean, a wiper from the ship's crew died and was buried at sea by his companions. Unfortunately, it has been impossible to fully identify this man, whose first name was Russell. On the fourth day of the lifeboat journey, an airplane circled the boat, dropped food by means of a parachute, and indicated to the men that they should travel in a westerly direction. The survivors were convinced that they would be rescued shortly after this occurrence and drank all of the remaining supply of fresh water on board. For the next five days, they had to depend on such rainwater as they could catch in blankets, etc., for drinking purposes. On the ninth day, land was sighted near Misha's Dominican Republic, where the men finally came ashore. Third Officer Mucci and the rest of the men were unanimous in their gratitude and praise for the efforts made on their behalf by the Dominicans in Misha's, a small community. They were given food, clothing, and a place to sleep in the local jail. Since there were no criminals being detained, they had the jail to themselves. Communications between Misha's and Ciudad Trujillo are difficult, and for this reason the men were obliged to remain there for two days before arrangements could be made to bring them to the capital. With the cooperation of the Dominican authorities, a Coast Guard vessel brought them from Misha's to Sabana de la Mar, where they were met by a Dominican army bus on July 10, and brought to the capital on the same day. Three ladies of the American community, one a trained nurse and two others experienced in first aid, also met the survivors at Sabana de la Mar, and brought the wounded gunner immediately in a private car to a hospital in Ciudad Trujillo. The lifeboat in which the men made their voyage is in the custody of the Dominican Coast Guard authorities in Sabana de la Mar. As reported in my cable number 330, on July 13 last, all the survivors of the Thomas McKean were repatriated on that date by two Ferry Command Army planes, with the exception of the naval gunners who departed today on a United States Coast Guard vessel, in accordance with arrangements made by the Naval Attaché. I am grateful to the Department for the prompt and efficient arrangements which were made for the repatriation by air of these survivors. As of possible interest to the department, there is enclosed here with a translation of communication from the president of the town council of Misha's, which was given to the third officer, Muchi, to deliver to me, and a copy of my reply thereto. There is also enclosed a list of the survivors from the S.S. Thomas McKean, landed in the Dominican Republic. Respectfully yours, A.M. Warren. Enclosures. 1. Letter is stated. 
2. Reply to 1. 3. List of survivors. BLB, MK. 711 Thomas McKean. Enclosure 1 to dispatch number 0026, dated July 17, 1943. From the American Legation at Ciudad Trujillo, DR. Translation SLM. Dominican Republic, Town Council of Mishas. Mishas, DR. July 10, 1942. From President of the Town Council of Mishas to Consul of the United States of America, Ciudad Trujillo, District of Santo Domingo. Subject, Attention to the Survivors of the Merchant Ship Thomas McKean. In the name of this town, which has had the satisfaction of being able to give hospitality to these patriotic men who are fighting for the right and for the liberty of the democracies, I am happy to salute you with the faith that this nation, under the wise direction of our President, General Asimo Dr. Rafael El Trujillo, cooperating with yours, will happily achieve the victory. With respectful salutations, signed, Ismail D. Adams, President of the Honorable Town Council. Enclosure number 2 to dispatch number 0026 of July 17, 1942, from the American Legation at Ciudad Trujillo, D.R. Ciudad Trujillo, D.R., July 14, 1942. The Honorable Ismail D. Adams, President of the Town Council, Misha's Dominican Republic. Dear Mr. Adams, I am very grateful for your kind letter of July 10, last, which was delivered to me by Mr. William Mucci, 3rd Officer of the S.S. McKean. All of the survivors of the Thomas McKean have spoken in the highest terms of the many courtesies and kindnesses shown to them by you and the people of Misha's. It is most gratifying to have this additional proof of the solidarity of the Dominican people with our common cause, and I share with you the hope and faith that our two countries will achieve the victory for which we are fighting. Sincerely yours, A. M. Warren. Enclosure number 3 to dispatch number 0026 of July 17, 1942, from the American Legation at Ciudad Trujillo, D.R. Survivors from the S.S. Thomas McKean. 1. William S. Mucci, third mate. 2. Tom Clark, oiler. 3. Frank A. Snyder, ordinary seaman. 4. Russell Nelson Ham, A.B. seaman. 5. Paul McCasline, water tender. 6. Eldred Harrington, seaman. 7. Luther Gothers, Mess boy. 8. Jesse Rumble, third engineer. 9. Oscar Thompson, oiler. 10. Albert Brooks, cook. 11. Coxswain Albert M. Rust, USNR. 12. Roy Adams, USNR. 13. Jack Cannon, USNR. 14. Dorsey Grave, USNR. So much for the survivors of the McKean. Comparatively speaking, they had an easy time of it. They were only 240 miles from land when they got sunk. Two boats were picked up within four and a half days. One got ashore in seven, and the last after nine days. This was a picnic compared to the crazing thirsty hell that many others went through. Only four lives were lost in this sinking out of a total of fifty-nine. But some inkling of the slaughter among ships then going on can be gained from the fact that this was the second time within six weeks that the chief engineer had been sunk. The reader will also note that there is no statement from Captain Respes of the McKean. As related by the chief engineer, he was picked up by the Coast Guard cutter, safe and sound. But on his way back to the States, on another ship... He got sunk again and was drowned.